Well, if you will, uh, take your Bibles once again and turn with me to Psalm chapter 107. You're getting used to that place, I think. Psalm 107. I want to move on this morning in this psalm, uh, beginning at verse number 4, and we'll remind you as we go a little bit about what has taken place and what the psalmist is doing. Title of the sermon sermon is The Wandering Soul. The Wandering Soul. Beginning at verse 4, they wandered in the wilderness in a desert region. They did not find a way to an inhabited city. They were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of their out of their distresses. He led them also by a straight way to go to an inhabited city. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. Well, this morning, I know that this is the Christmas season, and it is, and so we've emphasized that in our, in our music today. But I want us to continue to think on the theme and along the lines of being thankful and being a thankful people. And I also want to try to finish the psalm, not today, but at some point, work all the way through that. But, you know, traditionally and nationally, we give a single day out of the calendar of the year to reflect on reasons why we should be thankful. And so normally Thanksgiving comes and, and we gather together perhaps and the families share and the church family shares and reasons for we're thankful and then we move on and we start to focus on the incarnation and none of that's wrong and all of that's right. But I think we can be a thankful people if we also are reminded to continue to think about Thanksgiving. And of course, this psalm is emphasizing this as well and in the fact that it's the theme, a great theme in the psalm. But as Christians, just in Christians as general, in general, we experience all the problems that people around us experience, and perhaps even more so because we're believers, especially if we're in a society or a culture where Christianity is under, under the gun, so to speak, or being persecuted more. But we experience all of those things, but it's how we experience them that kind of sets us apart from those who do not know God in Christ and do not know God through Christ. But as Christians, we have been genuinely saved and we have been given a genuine new heart, a new disposition, a new inclination towards God. We have been made partakers of the divine nature. And so we have every reason in the world to be thankful year-round and not merely to emphasize it on the one day that we do nationally. We are, according to God's Word, to be a people that are really characterized by a thankful heart disposition. The Apostle Paul, writing to the believers at Thessalonica, said, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything, give thanks. So in our lives, no matter what we are facing, no matter how much of what we face we're facing, the Apostle Paul exhorts us as believers to be characterized by thanksgiving. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. As I mentioned, the theme of our psalm today is is also concerned with the importance of of being a thankful people, of of giving thanks. Giving thanks, we could say, is really the burden of the psalm. For example, if you look at verse 1, O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. It's the burden of the psalm. In our text, in verse number 8, it says, Let them give thanks to the Lord, for His loving kindness and for His wonders to the sons of men. 
And then that verse is repeated again in verse 15. And then repeated again in verse 21. And then repeated again in verse 31. So that the theme of Psalm 107, its burden is about giving thanks to God. In this psalm, in the verses that we read, grateful hearts are encouraged as a response to something that the Lord has done. He has, in verse 6, delivered us out of our distresses. He's delivered us out of our troubles. Thankfulness is also encouraged because of what the Lord has displayed. He has displayed His wonders in verse number 8. He is wonderful acts to us. And then furthermore, furthermore, gratitude is to be a result of something that the Lord is, and we read that back in verse 1, where we find that we are to give thanks to the Lord for He is good. As I said, the Christian is to be characterized by this heart of gratitude and of giving thanks, And it is quite natural in light of what we've read in our text, quite natural for us today as ones who have been delivered from our sins to point point towards our own salvation from our sins as evidence of what God has done. He's He's redeemed us for what God has displayed. He has granted to us mercy and grace and displayed His grace to us and of what God is, we know Him to be good. And as the psalmist said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. We have. So our God is good. And it is quite natural then for us to praise God for His deliverance in our salvation. The psalmist, in order to help his audience, help us to think more fully and to think more deeply and and even more personally to the end of giving thanks to the Lord, draws upon four dangerous situations in this psalm that would compel us to lead and to lead us to be grateful in hearts and to be thankful and to express our thanksgiving. The first situation is what we read in verses 4 through 9. That's our text. And here we see a picture of peril. A picture of peril. And first we have in verses 4 through 5, the wanderer's desperation. A wandering soul is in danger, it says. Verse 4, they wandered in the wilderness in a desert region. Who are the they? Well, perhaps they were some Israelites who had been taken into captivity, and now were returning to their homeland after a, a period of time of being in exile. Or more broadly speaking, it could be those who wandered and, uh, in a larger group and represented a larger number at various times. Anyone who had ever wandered in a, de- a, a desert region. So it could be representative of a greater number of individuals, and not necessarily Israelites. So this description of wandering around in a desert, a desert region actually presents us with the problem, the problem that the uh, wanderers are facing. The very location itself is problematic. It is, as the second part of verse 4 indicates, it is a vast distance away from an inhabited city. The wanderer is on his own. He's looking for a city. You ever thought about the cities and why this wanderers or these wanderers would be looking for a city? What's in a city? Well, let me just give you some thoughts about cities. And perhaps some of these would be challenged with the way we've seen some of our cities dealt with This year. But for the most part, what can we say about a city? Well, a city is where you find comforts of settled life. It's a place where life can flourish. A city is a place where one can put down roots and 
and have a good measure of peace and security. People are there. It's a place where one can pursue earthly interests, where making a living is much easier than when wandering about. It's a place that is more tame than the harsh realities of a wilderness desert region. There are mutually beneficial relationships which make life more manageable and make life more enjoyable. It's a place where one can improve himself and develop as a person and make ends meet. A city is a place where life can more readily have meaning and where one can find a good degree of satisfaction. In our text here, the wanderer's problem is that he is away from all of this. He is without the many conveniences of city life. And so that's his problem. But then next in the latter part of verse 4, we look at his plight. They're not only traveling over the hot sands of a desert, but the Scripture tells us here that they're lost. In verse 4, the latter part, it says, they did not find a way to an inhabited city. So being lost is not a pleasant condition to be in, especially in a desert region, is it? I was thinking about being lost, and I don't know if you've ever experienced um, a degree of that, but I did one year in Atlanta. I was um, doing night school in Atlanta, down, downtown Atlanta, and um, probably 40 minutes away, 45 minutes away from home, and uh, the professor had given us uh, uh, an address that we were to meet at that night, and so I wasn't familiar with that section of Atlanta, and, and I was driving, and we didn't have GPS, we didn't have cell phones at that time, and so it was just notes on a on piece of paper, and I can remember making a turn, and it was dark, and I don't remember if the moon was out, but I know it was dark, and I made a wrong turn. And I made a wrong turn and then made another wrong turn and I was going down the street and I was beginning to realize that I was lost. And I had the wrong direction. And so I backed up and as I backed up, I ended up in a ditch. I missed the drive, uh, driveway and ended up with my car in a ditch and could not get out of the ditch. So I got out of the car. And I looked around. Are there any homes around here? Again, you don't have a cell phone. You're going to have to go up to some strange home in the middle of the night and knock on the door and ask to use their phone. The only problem is the houses were very far apart, and when you looked for the house, they were way off the road. So the lights were low. There I am on the side of the road. And all of a sudden, here comes a pickup truck. And in the pickup truck, or a group of guys sitting in the back of it. This is nighttime, and they're a bit rowdy. It is as though that they have been drinking a little bit of something. And I'm thinking, this is not good. Here I am lost. I'm in Atlanta. I'm in the city. I don't know where I am. I don't have any resources of any kind and I'm stuck in a ditch, and here comes a pickup truck of guys with a bunch of them sitting in the back, and they stop. Okay, wow, now what? Well, they actually got out of the truck and pulled the car out of the ditch. Now, here this clean-cut Christian young man, and here are these a little bit a little bit loose, guys, and here they are helping me. And I remember the, the famous words of Peter, silver and gold have I none, but what I have, I, I gave them. I gave them a track as the only thing I had on me at the time. And they drove off, and I drove off, and I think I made the appointment, and I was where I was supposed to be. But I can remember that it was not a very comfortable thing to be lost. 
And here we find exactly that. This was their plight. They're traveling over hot sands of the desert, and they are lost. They did not find a way to an inhabited city. And in addition to being lost, the psalmist paints a more bleak situation. They're hungry and thirsty, it says in verse 5. Which, by the way, is not a good thing to be if you're in a desert region. Hungry and thirsty. They're wandering about. They were lost. They were hungry and thirsty. But it gets worse. They were feeling all of this emotionally. In fact, they were increasingly aware of their plight. And so the latter part of verse 5 says, they were desperate and despairing. Their soul fainted within them. Life, in fact, it seems, was slipping away. And again, despairing and in a desert region is not a good thing, is it? So in this description of the wanderer's desperation, you can almost discern a progression. As the psalmist paints for us, and and I think of it as a painting, he paints this picture, it is as though he continues to add to to the canvas dark colors, wandering about in a hot desert without clear directions, alone, hungering, and out of water, Desperate for relief, but only feeling despair. It's a picture that progressively gets worse and more dark, doesn't it? And suddenly in verses 6 and 7, we see the Lord's deliverance. In verse 6, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distresses. So when they came to the end of trying to manage things themselves, they cried out to the Lord. They've been wandering about, and it's come to the place where they have no hope. They cried out to the Lord. And I have one question. What took them so long? What took them so long to cry out to the Lord? And then I ask each one of us, is prayer then the air that we breathe every day? What happened when the wanderers prayed? Verse 6 says, the Lord delivered them out of their distresses. The Lord delivered them out of their troubles. The Lord answered their distress He answered their cry for help. And the Lord, brothers and sisters, hears us when we pray, doesn't He? If we're in sin, He hears us as we cry out for forgiveness of our sins, doesn't He? And when we're in distress as His children, our Heavenly Father desires for us to come to Him and cry out to Him, for He's eager to help us. He invites us before the throne of grace, doesn't He? Our God hears His children when we pray. And it should be the air we breathe as believers in Christ. Especially because we're His children, does He hear us. But we have biblical evidence, and we're talking about the goodness of our God. We have biblical evidence to suggest that the Lord will hear the cries of the distress even from those who may not know him savingly. And I want to suggest that this could be the case in, this, in a broad view of those wandering in the wilderness. I want to suggest to you that our God is compassionate and loving and caring to those that he has created, that those who may not know him can call out in their distress, and God at times will hear him and even deliver. Let me show you a biblical example of that. Turn, if you will, to the book of Jonah, chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1. Now you know the story of Jonah well. 
Jonah the prophet was to go to Nineveh. He was to preach the message of God, and and eventually he does. But before he does that, he decides instead of going in the one direction to Nineveh, he's deciding to disobey God and go in the complete opposite direction that God wants him to go with the message that the Ninevites needed to hear. So he's choosing to become the decider as to whether the Ninevites will hear the message of God or not, and he chooses to go in the opposite direction. He gets on board a ship, they get out into the water, and God raises up a storm. You know the story. That's where we pick it up in verse 8 of chapter 1. The mariners who were on ship, this is what happens. Then they said to Jonah, tell us now, on whose account? Has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? Speaking to Jonah. And where do you come from? Where is your country? From what people are you? And Jonah said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men became exceedingly frightened, and they said to him, How could you do this? That is, how could you flee with the message of deliverance for the people of Nineveh? How could you flee and go in the opposite direction? For the men knew, it says, that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Now think about this. It's the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Jonah, do you really think that you can flee from the presence of the Lord on the water? And Jonah said to them, pick me up, throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that on account of me this great storm has come upon you. However, the men rowed desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. Imagine they're taking the prophet They know the cure, throw the prophet over sea. Instead of killing the prophet, they're still trying to save everyone on board. Verse 14, though. As the storm increasingly got worse, then they called on the Lord and said, We earnestly pray, O Lord, Do not let us perish on account of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us, for thou, O Lord, hast done as thou hast pleased. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. I suggest that the mariners may not have been true believers. They may have been in some sense aware of something, but it becomes pretty clear that they're not aware of the God who made heaven and the seas. Jonah has to inform them as to who God is. But when it became desperate and when they were in such distress, they cried out to the Lord and He listened. And He saved them. So the Lord delivers from trouble. And oh, that all classes of people, all classes of men, whether they are believers or not, would understand our God is a compassionate God and that in their distress and trouble, they would look to that God and call out to Him. And notice the form of the deliverance in verse 7. Look at the form that it took. He led them also by a straight way to go to an inhabited city. He led them straight by a straight way to go to an inhabited city. That is precisely the need and the desire of the wanderers, isn't it? They cried out to the Lord, and He led them along the right path. He led them along a less difficult path than what they were journeying. He led them to the place of comfort and calm and rest and ease and safety. He led to the the place where they could more easily flourish in life, where there would be people, where there would be food, where there would be water, where there would be peace, where there would be safety. 
So, so far, we've seen the wanderer's desperation. And we've also seen the Lord's deliverance. But next, we look at the psalmist's directions to them. In verse 8, let them then give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. The psalmist, I think David, David gives thanks, says, give thanks you who have experienced the mercies of God. Give thanks you who have experienced the wondrous acts of God. Day after day, can we not imagine how many deliverances our Lord performs worldwide? And not just for his own, but for multitudes that cry out to him in their distresses. Would not the world be filled with the sounds of thanksgiving if all who were rescued expressed a grateful heart? Can you think of your pre-conversion days? Can you think of times in your distress? Maybe you didn't know the Lord in a saving way, but nevertheless, you knew enough to cry out to God at times. And you experienced some form of deliverance? Can you think of times like that? I can in my life. But people don't. When the Lord deliverance delivers, Often people don't give thanks. It should be a worldwide chorus because of the deliverances that God performs on a daily basis. And yet people don't. And this was sadly manifested in one of our Lord's encounters in his earthly ministry. You remember, you might remember the account in, in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 17. But in Luke chapter 17, Our Lord enters a a town, and it says in verse 11, And it came about while he was on the way to Jerusalem that he was passing between Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered a certain village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And it came about that as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back glorifying God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at his feet, at Jesus' feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who turned back to give glory to the God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Ten men had leprosy. Ten men literally had a death sentence on them for there was no cure for the leprosy. And when they encountered the Lord, they apparently understood that he could heal them. So they did what in their distress? They cried out to the Lord. And as they followed the command to go to the priests in keeping with the law of God, they were healed. And of the ten that received the mercy of the Lord and were healed, only one returned to glorify God and give thanks for his wondrous acts. Only one. Shouldn't the other nine have filled the air with giving thanks? And why didn't they? We can easily see how appropriate that would have been, right? It was clearly in the mind of Christ when he says, where are the other nine? Shouldn't they have returned to give glory to God? But again, you know, I think about us. Are we as ungrateful at times as these nine when our Lord does all that he does in our lives day after day and week after week and we experience the grace of God, not in in the major things that take place, but in the common things that God allows for us to have and, and to experience in our every week existence. So let us then, brothers, what verse 8 says, let us 
Sisters, be sure to give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. That's the psalmist's direction. Interestingly, the psalmist not only shows what the Lord's deliverance looked like back in verses 6 and 7, but he also shows a greater end in the deliverance in verse 9. And, and here we see the Lord's design. For he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul. He has filled with what is good. So the Lord satisfies he, brothers and sisters, alone satisfies. He fills the hungry soul with what is good, it says. Well, the account that we have here actually occurred in the lives of numerous Israelites as well as other travelers but the account reminds us that the Lord does not merely rescue the distressed from physical perils, from real life dangers. The story does remind us of the fact that the Lord delivers spiritually as well. And we know this well if we have come to know Christ in a saving way, right? If we paint with a broad stroke, if we look at this in our in, in an overview fashion, we can actually see the pathway to deliverance. And here I'm talking about spiritual deliverance, not physical deliverance. I'm talking about the old terminology of getting saved, of how does one get saved? How does one come to have his or her sins forgiven? How can they have a right standing before the eternal God? The pathway of deliverance is all right here in the text. And this is particularly of interest to the wandering soul. To whom does that refer? Metaphorically, I suggest it can refer to anyone who can identify with King Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. And that's why we read of Ecclesiastes chapter 2 this morning. It's the person who is wandering about and struggling with the most basic issues of life. What is life about? What is its meaning? Why am I here? How can I find life to be meaningful and satisfying and fulfilling? It's a person who is not casual about this life. It's not a person who's drifting through life as though life doesn't matter or their life doesn't matter or his or her life doesn't matter. The person is not just living and, and indifferent about throwing his life away. He's not wanting to waste his life. So this person thinks but he's a wanderer because he moves from one hopeful answer to another. And as in our scripture reading, he may go off to enjoying pleasures because he thinks that enjoying pleasures, he may find the meaning of life. Or he may later discover that that doesn't work, and so he loses himself in work and busyness only to find that his devotion to his work doesn't do it either. It doesn't satisfy, it doesn't fulfill, and it doesn't bring meaning to his life in the way that he hoped that it would. Or even if he goes off to determine to become wealthy, and he gives himself to gaining wealth. And in all of these things, he finds himself losing. Life isn't about these things, none of these things truly, truly satisfy. All of his efforts only lead him to the conclusion that we found in the Scripture reading, so I hated life for the work which had been done under the sun without reference to God was grievous to me because everything is futility and a striving after wind. That's the plight of the person who is wandering, the wandering soul, who thinks that he can find satisfaction in anything other than God, and he can't. 
He can't. Everything in this desert that we call life, the wise man said, was striving after wind. So for this wandering soul, this one that is seeking meaning, to understand meaning, what is the true pathway to deliverance? It's all here in our text in Psalm 107. Here's the first thing, just broadly. Number one, salvation comes only from the Lord. Salvation comes only from the Lord. That is what the wandering soul in our psalm finally sought when he came to the end of his own resources, when all self-reliance and self-righteousness and self-centeredness was put aside, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distresses. Apart from the Lord, there is no salvation. So Jesus can say it with the most exclusive of all statements in John 14, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. The Lord alone saves. As we find in the book of Jonah, salvation is of the Lord. But secondly, The second thing our text indicates is that this deliverance from the Lord is available to everyone. It's available to everyone who seeks it. Now, I know, I know some of you Reformed thinkers out there are saying no one seeks after God. That is precisely true. And yet, seeking after God is precisely what they need to do. No one seeks after God, yet they must seek after God. And God enables them to seek after God by the grace of God. If they find themselves seeking the Lord, it is because the Lord is seeking them. But do you understand that this deliverance is available to everyone who will? For Jesus said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. A universal call. Come. And so few do. So few do come. And yet the invitation is there. It's for all who will turn to him. Then the third thing we find is that sin's form is not the issue. Sin's form is not the issue. In our text, we have a wandering soul. Next, we'll find someone who's imprisoned. Next, we're going to find someone who is sick physically. And then finally, there's one who is caught in the storm on the sea. And God delivers in each case. It's not the form that's the issue. It doesn't matter what form sin has taken in a person's life. If he will but repent and call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he will be delivered from his sin. He will be delivered and saved and be given eternal life. Then what? So what if I do that? Well, the Lord himself will become our satisfaction. He will lead us to the fullness of life, and that fullness of life will be in him. Brothers and sisters, are you finding that Jesus Christ is why we exist? Are you finding Jesus Christ to be your satisfaction? That everything is about him. He's Lord. We bow to him. We are his slaves. He's our master. And what a good master. He is. He alone satisfies our hearts. He alone, nothing else, nothing else. What you might pursue for self-glory will not 
bring you the happiness and the joy in life that only Christ Jesus can provide. And yet it's open for all, no matter the form of sin an individual is caught in, if he repents of his sin and turns to Christ in faith, then Christ will save him and lead him to his city. Well, that's what the psalmist is saying, I think, about the wandering soul. Are you wandering? Pastor, you know, we're here every week. Yeah, I know. I just thought I'd ask. Are you wandering? Do you know Christ? Have you turned from sin and put your trust in him alone? And are you living for him? And brothers and sisters, are you finding Jesus Christ to be your satisfaction in life? No matter where you are or what station of life you're in or how difficult you find life to be, are you looking to him to be your satisfaction? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the picture of peril that you've given us today in this passage. And Father, we thank you for the, the way that it explains the need for man to turn to you. And when he does, what happens? And Lord, as your people, we pray that we'll not hesitate to cry out to you. That we'll not hesitate to pray. But Lord, for those who do not know you, we would pray that they would now turn out, turn and call out to you. That they would now turn from their sin and cry out to Jesus Christ for salvation. For you are the Savior of the whole world, especially of those who believe. So we pray, Father, that you will use this passage in our hearts, cause us to find our meaning in life centered upon our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. For we ask it in his name. Amen.